Fed has made the economy more unstable than it was before the Fed. They, the keeper of the keys of the magic kingdom of money, would rather you didn't understand. They would like to be thought of as the problem solver that shows up and puts out the fire. But in fact, they're really the arsonist that started the fire to begin with. For over a century, the United States financial leadership, guided by its central bank, the Federal Reserve, has acquired immense control over the economy. Yet the Fed's dominant role on the global economic stage and its impact on everyday Americans often goes unexamined. It's time to look behind the curtain at this pivotal institution to see how it works, how its decisions have affected our lives, and if we need a Fed to secure our financial future. Before we can dive into a deeper analysis of the Fed, there are several fundamental concepts and historical events which are important to understand. The first of which is, what is money? So economists look on money as the general medium of exchange. That is that everyone sells the things that they produce or they sell their services for something that everyone else will accept. For thousands of years, human civilization settled on gold and silver as the main sources of money. And in modern society, everyone accepts money. But it's also a common unit of account. And what we mean by that is that it's a pricing unit. So everyone prices their goods and services that they desire to sell in terms of money, which makes it easy for people to compare the prices of different goods. So where do banks fit in? People observed that it was cumbersome to carry these around, so bankers came into existence, and uh, bankers would issue a piece of paper that said it's a claim on gold. Whoops, that's, beginning. that's your monetary original sin right there. When banks were invented, they are basically the warehouses of gold, or whatever gold that you had, you would be given a certificate that you could use to redeem the gold and whatever you wanted it back. Money's a commodity, like any other commodity, and it has a supply and demand. In the United States, that's the good old dollar bill. Also, checking deposits, which are claims to dollar bills held by banks. Well, the role is to make it easy for people to exchange. How do banks make a profit? With fractional reserve banking, it involves creating new money out of thin air, but it comes with risks. Fractional reserve banking is just the idea that banks keep a fraction of deposits in reserve. So like somebody walks in and makes a, a deposit. What they actually do is they take that money and they use it to, to finance loans that they make to, to other people, business loans, mortgages, that sort of thing. Let's say they can lend out 90%, that they're comfortable with keeping $1 for every $10 that people will deposit. So you can write checks up to $1,000 on that checking deposit, but at the same time, there's 900 more dollars in circulation than there was before you made that deposit. So in that case, they immediately create money. That new money can then be loaned out by the originating bank and deposited into another bank, which can then loan out a portion of those deposits. It means that enough depositors could come to the bank requesting the money. The bank would come up dry. They, they wouldn't have all the money there because they've used the money to, to finance those loans. Now, you may be asking yourself, where does the government fit into all this? So if we look around the world, we find almost every country has a central bank because central banks are really handy. In creating the Bank of France, Napoleon said, I want a bank that'll always lend me money. And that's what all governments want, spend more money than they have. That's the way they get reelected. If it's financed by taxation, people immediately realize that it's coming out of their own pockets. And the way it works in politics, is the politicians love the Fed because it creates uh, what economists call a fiscal illusion, the sort of the promise of something for nothing. If everything is guided by all of this money printing and no bank is overextending itself, the whole system is, is working together and not expanding. That way the whole system is, is sort of a cartel. In other words, all the banks inflate together because they're all under the umbrella now of the Fed. Prior to the creation of the Fed, people were using gold as money, and the gold standard was a constraint on government spending. People will say the dollar was backed by gold. No, it was defined as gold, very important. Very important distinction, it was defined as a weight of gold. And uh, it was codified in 1900, Gold Standard Act in 1900. People walked around with $20 gold pieces uh, in their pants pocket. You know, gold was a functional currency. They weren't gonna experience financial disaster if uh, that's what the system was about. And importantly, it restrained the ability of government to do what governments now do, is just spend like Santa Claus. And so in the beginning, that system seemed to work. 
If the gold standard worked, why did the government create the central bank we now know as the Federal Reserve? Responding to the pressures of special interests that rose out of the Progressive Era, and after years of regional and local banks failing due to fractional reserve banking, in 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was passed by the U.S. Congress and signed into law by President Woodrow Wilson. The Fed came into being with every legislative promise that the gold standard would remain. The Fed was only supposed to be a lender of last resort, it was only to prevent mass bank failures. And the goal was to stabilize the banking system, stabilize all the booms and busts that they were seeing. The act created 12 regional Federal Reserve banks to serve distinct geographic areas of the United States. It required every national bank to become a member and hold stock in their respective regional Federal Reserve Bank. Each Federal Reserve Bank is a corporation. Every bank in the district must subscribe to shares in the respective reserve banks in proportion to the capital of that private bank. Federal Reserve Banks are banks. They have balance sheets, they have loans, they have investments, they have deposits, they have borrowed funds, they have capital. It's like a bank. To manage the system, the act established a seven-member Federal Reserve Board, now known as the Board of Governors. The supposed intent was to provide stability, banking expertise, and a diverse range of perspectives. When the Fed was created, the Secretary of the Treasury was William Gibbs McAdoo. And he gave a great speech at the time in which he said, now that we have the Fed, financial booms and busts have ended. The Fed has made all of this only in the past, and we're entering a new world where this won't happen. And then the crash happens, and they find out they lost their job, they lost their business. In 1933, Congress passed a new banking act, supposedly to restore confidence. This act set the stage for the ever-changing evolution and increasing power of the Fed. It created the Federal Open Market Committee to manage the Fed's open market operations and formulate monetary policy. So the, the Federal Open Market Committee, which consists of all the governors and a selection of the respect reserve banks of so these dozen outposts makes interest rate policy. And that those basically involved buying or selling short-term government securities. The president appoints the, uh, the chairman of the Fed. Well, it, it's kind of like rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. You could call this institution the Fed, or you could call it the government money printing apparatus, but it would create all the same problems. I think now that boom and bust is the wrong figure of speech. I think that we should use fires and uh, fire departments putting them out. And the Fed serves a dual purpose. It is both the arsonist and the fireman. The Austrian business cycle theory says that credit expansion leads to economy-wide distortions. This means resources are misdirected toward unsustainable projects. This creates a boom and bust cycle, where an unsustainable economic expansion built on misdirected resources is followed by a sharp decline. The Fed you know, came into business. Before you knew it, it was doing the government's work of inflating the currency. When someone is manipulating the unit that we're all using, that that's going to have adverse consequences. The Fed actually intends to cheapen the value of your money by 2% a year. It's kind of this monetary shoplifting, skimming 2% off the top of whatever you think you earned. We still have financial crises. We still have booms and busts. This is the government getting into the act and get into the act they did in a big way. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. So in 71, they might have done other things like raise the price of gold, say, well, dollars are worth less, but instead they just said, no, we're not paying. So tough luck. But it was tough luck for the world because that allowed in a pure paper money world, that is to say currency which has no intrinsic value, could be created with no link to gold or other precious metals in peacetime. It's all fiat currency. It's all just paper. What is fiat money? Fiat money is the opposite of the inherently valuable gold coin. And thereafter, from that day to this, the dollar has owed its value to habit, to confidence in this great country. 
This shift to a fiat currency created dramatic economic uncertainty. As foreign exchange markets became volatile, prices ballooned. Higher costs led to job losses. The combination gave us a new financial term, stagflation, and that became a defining feature of the decade. And in the middle of that, as a result of the 1970s inflation, then under Paul Volcker, the Federal Reserve forced up interest rates to break the inflation and to break these bubbles. In the 1980s, these interest rates had a weak economy, made it more difficult for governments and banks to repay their debts, contributing to the savings and loan crisis and the debt crisis in Latin America. And when that great inflation finally stopped in the 80s, we had a lot of markets which had come to rely on the inflation of asset prices and on the printing of money. Why would the Fed want to use inflation to create winners and losers? The reason is somebody profits from it. And if somebody's profiting from it, somebody else is losing by it. And it's a really good example of what the Fed does in a general sense, which is they, they create winners and losers. It means that the Fed has fundamentally altered the makeup of the economy. The Fed creates inflation, and it does so not just because it wants to see prices rise, because if all prices rose, there'd be no reason for inflation. But in the real world, when money's injected into the economy, some people get it first. So as, as soon as you take on this ability to, to bail out some people, it means that you are saying you get to be the winner, and everybody else who doesn't get bailed out, they get to be the losers. So who are the winners? They're not elected officials. To some extent, they're doing the bidding of elected officials, Fed bureaucrats, um, but they're rearranging uh, our lives by, by messing with, with, with the money. The government is always the winner because when the Fed is printing up new money, it, it means that the government can benefit. It means that the government is, they're the first spender of the brand new money. So large corporations, not small corporations, large banks, not small banks. And then the political elites that sort of control the political system. The people who get the money first are also the same sort of people who have the most influence on the Fed itself. Politicians can offer this program, that program, to benefit everybody, and they don't have to raise taxes. Now, who are the losers? The average working American and their family unit is who really pays the price uh, during this cycle of boom and bust that the Fed is supposedly saving us every time. It's Econ 101, you can't get something from nothing. Physics 101 as well. <laughs> and so what that means is it's it's the government taking, and it's the cost of that is going on to everybody else. Going off the gold standard took away that certainty, and it injected the Fed with more power, which has created more uncertainty. Now, when they print up the money to pay for the loss, that's effectively a debt of the U.S. government. So every time they tell us that they're solving a problem, what they're really doing is rescuing their own reputation from what they previously brought on. Unless you're the Fed, you can't stay in business and do that. When it comes to the economy, it seems crises and the Fed go hand in hand. The Fed has always used emergencies to expand their powers. And so as we have more crises that are generated by the Fed and the banking system, it gives them a foundation for new interventions. It gives them a chance to grab more power. In the wake of the crises of the late 20th century, after the country went off the gold standard, the financial sector exploded in size as the country shifted away from industrial production. The growing dominance of finance over other sectors of the economy became known as financialization. So financialization is, is the treatment of finance not as the means to an end, but as an end in itself. It doesn't really produce anything by itself. It just helps us with financial matters, with investing, with raising capital, with allocating savings, those kind of things. So we're talking about stocks, bonds, banks, and so forth. So you can see the financialization of the economy and how the finance, insurance, and real estate companies, that's, that sector has has exploded, especially since we went off the gold standard. These dominant Wall Street banks are now cartels, empowered in that uh, regard by the Federal Reserve itself. And in the new millennium, the Fed seemed to assume a more aggressive role. 
the economists in the late 90s and early 2000s to begin to talk about the fact that we were in a great moderation. But we found out that the great moderation really was, was the great leveraging up, the great inflation of money. And so uh, they use language like that, as do all government bureaucracies, to make things seem uh, much more pleasant than they, than they really are. The Fed use the argument that, well, we have to make sure that unemployment stays low and that production stays high and that growth is going along at a good pace. The Fed doesn't do anything but, but drop interest rates and, and, and print money. That's all it does. Every time they create a bubble and the bubble bursts, uh, their response is, well, we need to create another bubble. The Fed worked to push interest rates down below the natural rate, and this is where we saw the housing bubble being inflated. And basically, the Fed created a housing bubble after 2001 with very low interest rates and a lot of moral suasion for people to buy houses and to be invested in housing, and the American people responded. So what was the role of big banks in Wall Street in all of this? We had people in Wall Street, New York banks, who had never even experienced a Fed interest rate hike, never in their entire career. It had only been going down. And so that encouraged them to take all of those risks. They were making all of these loans. They were helping blow up the, the housing bubble. So they put money in the economy and the Fed and everybody looks like, well, the government's rich now and this sort of thing. And before you knew it, there was a big bubble and the bubble was supported by people who wanted a house and get their interest rates low. Now, what do you do then? If you try to increase the money supply, um, that pushes prices up that causes a worse inflation. On the other hand, if you try to tighten money, that causes a recession, and, and that turns into a full-blown downturn. This could be the most serious recession in decades, and that means life, as most Americans know it, is about to change, in some cases, dramatically. What happened in 2008 was that some of the big investment banks, the ones that are most closely tied into government were affected. And those people are the movers and the shakers. They're the ones that contribute to campaigns. The Fed undertook these policies as an emergency measure to address what they themselves had all created. 2008 brought a new crisis, and the Federal Reserve started using new tools and programs it had not used before. They made it seem like this is a crisis that's affecting all of us. So now, instead of the Fed uh, targeting a, a particular federal funds rate or a range of federal funds rates, now the, the Fed is changing the supply of reserves in the system through open market operations. And so they came up with all these different ways of injecting new money into the system. Using partially some tax dollars and some just money printing by the Fed, to give all these big banks billions of dollars. And they started buying, but even more radical than that was they started buying mortgages. They bought, the Fed bought mortgages in the form of mortgage-backed securities. They started buying mortgage-backed securities as opposed to just government debt. They were intervening and in, in bailing out specific corporations. So it's not surprising that we saw a big run-up. The price went up regardless of the value of the company or the value of the bond or the value of the land or the value of the real estate. So that was a change where they were brazen about what they were doing, open about picking the winners. They're receiving the new money first and they're receiving it at lower interest rates than they would have been. And the Fed since that time has been operating with just one new policy one surprise policy after another. The Fed's new policies took it deep into previously untouched areas of the economy. This resulted in an everything bubble of inflation where prices for a wide range of assets and goods and services were constantly increasing. So there's nothing wrong with prices in general going up or down. It's just that when the government is in control of, of the money supply, it can use that up and down in prices to benefit certain groups. In an in inflationary environment, your incentives are to consume. Your incentives are to, to unload the money as soon as you get it uh, and go buy things. I, any amount of money that you've accumulated that's not invested or used to buy consumption goods is going to be losing value in this permanent inflation that we have. And both the bubble and the problems are really the result of this unprecedented and, in my view, unwise mortgage financing effort of the Fed of making itself into a giant savings and loan. 
the way that uh, regular consumers become increasingly indebted, they've got to get those loans from somewhere. And so Wall Street definitely gains as a result of the Fed's money printing. These bailouts socialize the losses. So they create a system with the banks of the profits are mine, the losses are on you, the taxpayer. And that's uh, horribly destructive of the whole free market system. So each crisis that they cause gives them a chance to, to grow even more. And with each crisis, the Fed is, is gaining more and more power. And as they gain more power, they intervene more and create even bigger crises. As if that wasn't enough, in 2020, the World Health Organization announced a pandemic. We had a virus go around the world, and much to everybody's surprise, it caused a financial collapse. Everybody's attention moved completely away from what was going on in the marketplace and in the economy, and everybody was focused solely on the virus and the shutdowns and what was happening to businesses and jobs and the economy. For a long time during the lockdown, people didn't really spend that money or they spent it on Amazon and not on brick and mortar shops. And that's forced prices up tremendously. And so it's quite natural that most people associate the recession that we went through at that time with the virus rather than with the Fed. The government's message was that the global economy was collapsing due to COVID, and the Fed responded with its inflationary tools. We were headed downhill when COVID hit. And then when COVID hit, well, the government decided to spend trillions of dollars to keep the economy going. And the Fed accommodated that by basically printing trillions of dollars. So the Fed is a, the you know, Fed bought everything that wasn't nailed down and indeed uh, took a hammer and stripped some of those nails away and it was um, an all purpose, all front bailout. But when the crisis was over, they didn't stop. They went right on. And so now they're lending indirectly to specific companies. And it's, it really is a systemization of the a too big to fail concept. It's actually, it's too big to fail permanently. It's a great example of the way that the Fed has ballooned in power. But the misconception is that the Fed somehow knows the economic future, the financial future, and therefore knows how to manipulate it through manipulating interest rates, through manipulating supply of money, through buying, uh, as they have bought, trillions of dollars of uh, bonds and mortgages. The Fed's buying had far-reaching ramifications for the financial world, but did they consider who else would be affected? The free market economies are uh, peopled by human beings. When you see higher prices at the grocery store, when you see higher energy bills, uh, when, when you see higher prices anywhere, you should be thinking about how that loss of your purchasing power is the government's gain. And so the, the Fed induces people to consume now, live for the present, and not worry about the future. The step-by-step -step process by which money spreads throughout the economy and impoverishes the people who get the money late or those people who are retired and on, on fixed incomes and never get the new money. One group that would uh, certainly be harmed would be younger generations. The people on Main Street didn't get it. They didn't benefit. In fact, they were hurt young people, Gen Z, et cetera. What they're facing is not just a Fed that can inflate the money supply out of thin air and evaporate anything that they've been able to accumulate. When the Fed increases the money supply, and especially in the amounts and the ways that it did so during COVID, that it really redistributes wealth. And it redistributes wealth away from the middle class away from Main Street towards Wall Street and Silicon Valley. When wealth shifts this much, there was always chaos. Everything just sort of broke at the end of COVID. The big picture there is the monetary system facilitates this continued buildup of the combination of corporations, corporatism, and the government. What this means is that there's one group who will definitely benefit by acquiring all of this wealth, acquiring all of this capital, whereas another group is, they always have the, uh, the short end of the stick. So you, you can definitely say that there are some sectors uh, that are closer to the beginning of this chain of, of spending. At the very front is the government. And then the Fed gets rewarded in, in various ways after that. Because the way the Fed finances its own salaries 
is when it when it buys bonds, it prints up the money, free money, counterfeit money, buys bonds with it. And so that money goes into the banking system. That's how the money supply increases. But in terms of like who's who's first, who's second, who's third, that, that's not something that we can uh, pinpoint exactly. But we can definitely say that there is a wealth transfer. There are benefits to being at the beginning and there are costs to being at the end. Think of the government together as being both the Treasury and the Fed. One, so as the Fed loses money and just borrows more money to finance its losses, it's just running up the debt and it's a cost to the taxpayers. We should definitely be more upset about the institutionalized inflation, the fact that inflation is a permanent feature of our economy. Using inflation to enrich some while impoverishing others seems to have become the Fed's ultimate weapon. People feel that inflation, which is a, a systematic depreciation of the currency, but uh, to put that in context, the Fed actually intends to cheapen the value of your money. That's why the politicians like it. And also the Fed, they use the Fed as a whipping boy. When things go bad, when the rubble bursts, they call in the chairman of the Fed and they lambast the Fed chairman and, and his associates there and, and shift the blame to to them. So what, what it means is that we've got this Leviathan central bank. We've got this bank that has taken on huge powers and is always shifting. One implication of that is that it makes it really difficult to predict what's, what's going to happen because it means that you have to not only forecast the market, but you have to forecast what the Fed is going to do and also how the market will respond to the Fed. And it's like a mood board. You know, uh, they'll say, we expect the inflation rate to be thus. We expect growth to be the following. And it's always wrong because the future is a closed book. Now it seems like the future of money is ramping up toward a Fed-controlled digital currency. Is a central bank digital currency with its value fixed by the Fed a good thing or a threat? The Federal Reserve as it exists today has a ton of power and it would just be magnified tenfold, a hundredfold with a central bank digital currency. It poses a large threat to American citizens because then they can program these things so that they can neutralize them if you were trying to buy goods that the government doesn't want you to spend money on. It, it means that they could have programs in it. You can buy certain things, but not other things. A digital currency would be so helpful to the Fed. And, uh, if they don't like the way you're spending money because they'll see you spend it, that would be the Fed's window into your life. So if their, if their perspective is that in a crisis we need to stimulate spending, we will tax you a certain amount at the end of this time period if you haven't spent your money. So I, what I think they're doing is they're priming the pump. They're, they're trying to talk about the, the pros and the cons of the central bank digital currency idea. And I think the idea is for them to, to roll it out during the middle of some crisis in the future. And, and people will think back uh, and they'll say, oh yeah, this is fine. The, the Fed's own digital currency, like Bitcoin without the fun. With so many ways of manipulating the money supply and the financial sector, the Federal Reserve now has far more power than ever before. So the Fed has virtually nationalized the financial system. Who approved that? How did that get made formal? The answer is they just said it themselves. That way the whole system is, is sort of a cartel. The whole system is, is working together. It's all kind of like the scene at the end of the movie, The Wizard of Oz, where they, where the, the great wizard is finally there and, and everybody's in awe. And then all of a sudden the curtain is pulled back by the dog and, and, you, and you see the phoniness of the whole thing. So the real question is, is the Fed really the fireman or the arsonist? They come in and say, well, we'll cut interest rates. Uh, you know, we'll bail out the banks, we'll, you know, bail out the stock market, we'll bail out foreigners, we'll do all of this. When in effect, they're the arsonists that started the fire to begin with. It sets the fire by starting off printing new money and injecting it into the economy to drive prices up. Then when it sees prices rising, the Fed itself jumps in and claims that it's trying to balance unemployment and inflation, when in fact, it's really not the firemen that's protecting them from the flames of inflation. And so for hundreds and hundreds of years, people have understood the danger of government control of money. So it makes it uncertain even for an individual when, whenever the government creates price inflation and, and does that to our money. What has happened, the leaders in this country, the people who control the financial system and the financial system and the whole works, they work on a basis of immorality. But it is the arsonist and it continues to be the arsonist in the guise of a fireman, it's a crazed fireman. 
The financial world under the Fed seems to have evolved into madness. Is it time for a new approach? So we live in very, very dangerous times, mainly because we've allowed the Fed to control the world monetary system. And just because you have debt and turn it into money, that does not mean real wealth. And while they're guessing, they create uh, great inflations and booms and busts. Inflation, booms and busts. The results of excessive government and the ramifications of these cycles of instability were identified by an influential economist in 1912. So the boom-bust cycle, a term that we use to refer to Austrian business cycle theory, and it was developed by Ludwig von Mises in his book, The Theory of Money and Credit. But Mises was one of the first economists to fully explain that when money is introduced into the economy, prices don't all go up at once, and, and, and people's incomes don't go all up at once. So if you have an entity working behind the scenes, manipulating the value of that monetary unit, then that's going to cause that's naturally gonna cause some kind of trouble. Basically what it says is that in a unhampered market economy, this works fantastically. So people decide to save uh, and people decide to consume and, and the balance of, of that interaction gives us a market interest rate and it gives entrepreneurs good information on, on what lines of production to, to pursue. The Austrian business cycle theory doesn't predict the timing. Um, some people say that's a flaw, but it's not really a flaw because people have free will and they, they can spend their money or not spend their money as they see fit. Austrian economists following Mises have always placed a very high priority on money because it's the one thing we all have in common. We all use money and he realized that central banks in manipulating money and manipulating credit induced this artificial boom, and the consequence of that is the economic bust, or what we call now the recession. Murray Rothbard expanded on Mises' Austrian school economics. In his works, he advanced the idea of limiting government intervention and abolishing fractional reserve banking. The importance that Austrian economics brings to the general economic table is that we think money is very, very important and the natural stability of the monetary unit is very important for everyone in society. Murray Rothbard, who was one of the co-founders, really, of the Mises Institute here, once said that, uh, you know, if government got in the business of making shoes early on, people would be saying, well, who would make shoes? The government has always made shoes. And the, the same thing goes for the Fed. A lot of people think, well, yeah, the Fed has always been in control of the money supply, but it hasn't. Rothbard, even more, pointed out that an increase in the money supply does not benefit society. It benefits some at the expense of others. Whenever you're in control of the printing press, whenever you're in control of how much money there is, you're going to create winners and losers. There is no social benefit from increasing the money supply. Any money supply is sufficient to allow people to trade for all the goods and services they want to, but just at a lower price. Will government leaders ever do what it takes to stop the inflation? Inflation is what you see on an everyday basis when you go to the supermarket, when you stop at the gas station, it's all around you. The real evil tax is the inflation tax because it hits the middle class and the poor. When I look out there, I see a lot of government debt, a lot of private debt, and a lot of things working against the free market economy, working against free trade, an inability and almost an unwillingness on the part of the players in the system to seek out peaceful, cooperative solutions to emerging problems and rather to use those emerging problems to their, their own political benefit. What should we do with the Fed, the country's political central bank? We went for a long time without, without a central bank. And, you know, think about it. Let's put all the money in the hands of politicians in a secret organization that is never allowed to be audited. The government's a mess, the Fed's a mess. We should get back to a system in which money is out of the hands of government. It's a political game. That's why whenever a congressperson like Ron Paul would argue for auditing the Fed, the entire banking industry would rally around and send millions to both political parties in Washington to kill it, to kill the bill, to audit the Fed. No, we, we don't need a Fed. And what that would mean is we would get the money supply that the, the market can bear and the market would produce. If you mess around with interest rates, people do dumb things. They buy too much stuff or build too many buildings or cars. 
and that's through the creation of the bubble and that always has to has to be corrected a life without a fed is constant growth and slowly falling prices which benefits the entire population including people on fixed incomes who are really hurt by inflation take away the power of the fed to ever buy anything again because that's how they print new money by buying assets in the market we can end the fed's power and activities today we can take them completely out of interest rate setting policies. We can take them completely out of the money creation process today. And you, Fed, you're not the decision maker here. You shall not drown mankind <laughs> in a flood of paper money. If Mises were here today, I think he would be full on in support of ending the Fed altogether. If the Fed ended, and with it ended, the pure paper dollar, it would be left to all of us politically and individually to evolve a new system. What kind of money would the people like imposed on them? Well, how about sound money? People should be able to write contracts in terms of monies, gold, silver, foreign currencies, that, that they voluntarily agree upon. So you can view this as very closely intertwined with the freedom and independence and responsibility of the citizens having a sound money on one side versus a perpetually inflating currency which favors the ever-expanding power and spending by deficit, financed by inflation, uh, of the government. So this is really a profoundly important political and constitutional question. I think these are steps back to the gold standard or commodity money standard. Uh, the gold standard uh, was, uh, was a constraint. You know, it, uh, it was the, uh, the marker of the, uh, of the government's uh, commitment, expressed or implicit, to honor the integrity of the currency. Now I say integ integrity is a, is a moralistic word, but money is work, and work is heartbeats and heartbeats are finite. You have to take a, a life-risking surgery to get your cancer out of your belly, and uh, that's the only thing that we can do. Economically, you just get rid of the Fed if you want to have sound money and a healthy economy. Hmm, that doesn't sound so bad.